So welcome everyone to DBT Office Hours. Um, this week we're doing a snowplow special. Um, we have a few special guests uh, that are joining us. So we have Nyanka from uh, Snowplow. Would you like to introduce yourself and um, potentially correct my pronunciation there? Oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Nyanka. Yeah, I'm a uh, data consultant at, at Snowplow Analytics. And uh, we are going to do some stuff today. So I'm, I'm really curious how it's going to turn out. Cool. Um, and then leading the office hours today, I actually have two of my uh, esteemed co-workers. So Drew Bannon uh, and Jeremy Cohen. Drew, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Claire. My name's Drew Bannon. I run product here and uh, historically I've done a lot of our snowplow tracking. Uh, so I big fan of snowplow. Uh, I really like installing it on websites in Google Tag Manager, which I think we'll show you a little bit of today. And uh, Happy to ask or answer any questions about like uh, DBT, Snowplow, how they work together, things like that. Cool. Um, and Jeremy? I did I'm say Jeremy. We might have jumped. I'm good. I'm here. Uh, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm also doing product work now at Fishtown, but formerly a lot of our consulting professional services work, uh, including for a bunch of different companies who have implemented Snowplow over the course of time, um, using it for uh, different things and and extending it in a variety of ways. So I've only gotten to do maybe like two implementations and Drew is sitting next to me the whole time, but uh, I've gotten to work with Snowplow data a whole bunch of times. And um, I'll be showing later on some Snowplow data in Snowflake, all of the snows working together. Yeah, really cool. Um, for those of you who, uh, who I don't know, I'm Claire, I'm the DBT community manager. Um, I'm the host of Office Hours. Um, and we sort of pulled this one together uh, because we had a request from a community member, Joel, who's on the call today. Um, so if there's a topic that you are interested in, uh, you know, us deep, you know, going, having a deep dive into, whether that's on our side, because we know a lot about it, um, or whether that's, you know, something that we can ask a community member to speak on, um, please let me know because it helps, uh, helps us shape what these office hours look like. Um, so I myself have actually never worked with Snowplow data. Um, so I was very happy that we have people on the team who are willing to join me on this office hours. Um, I just haven't, uh, none of the clients that I've worked with historically have used Snowplow. So I'm really excited myself to learn today. Um, and so in the next, I don't know, half hour, we'll see how we go. Uh, I was actually the, the client in a sense for this. Um, so I wanted Snowplow installed on my personal website uh, and I managed to engage Fishtown Analytics to do this work for me. So yeah, Drew, do you want to have a ch talk through some of the work um, that you've been doing for me as your client? For sure. Um, so Claire, I've got bad news. I'm actually a little behind on this project. Uh, <laughs> oh, some yeah. things came up. It's been a tough couple of weeks here. Um, what I actually did was I set up a lot of the groundwork and I was hoping that we could kind of together actually install the Snowplow tracking snippet on the website. Uh, we're going to do this through Google Tag Manager. And um, there's like a ton of opportunity for uh, variance in how you actually set up Snowplow on a given website. Uh, we can certainly talk about that, but this is gonna be a pretty simple, straightforward version. And if anyone has any questions about kind of why we're doing things or maybe what the other ways of doing things are, um, I certainly could do my best to speak about them. And uh, Ninka, if you wanna um, hop in at any point too, uh, I think everyone would love to hear from you as well. Um, so with that, I'll share my screen and we'll, we'll get right into it. All right, can everyone see uh, clairecarol.com? Uh, I'm going to do one of these, and I'm going to do one of these. Um, I just changed monitors, and that made everything break. Let me try that again, sorry. OK, Chrome. Everyone seeing the website? Perfect. So OK, maybe a good starting point is, um, what is Snowplow? Um, Nika, do you actually have like a prepared thing you, you would want to say about this? I'm also happy to talk about it. Uh, I don't have any fancy slides or anything, but um, to, to answer your question, uh, we're an event data gathering solution, I guess is the best way to, uh, to describe it. Um, so anything that happens on, on your website or on your game or wherever, we, we capture it and neatly deliver it uh, in, a, in a couple of different warehouses. Right on. So. Our goal here is going to be to uh, say just measure the number of page views happening 
on this particular website. Um, there's certainly a lot of other events that you can track, but for a website like this, it's a static website. There's no fancy add to cart, uh, check out, click the pop-up, close the pop-up uh, type user interactions that you might expect on say an e-commerce website. Um, and so what we're gonna do is just like track page views. It'll be very simple. And uh, the way that we're gonna do that is we actually, um, I did this earlier today with Claire's help. I added a Google Tag Manager snippet to the website and the build actually succeeded, ignore the X. And so what that looks like is just kind of this like pre-baked tag that Google Tag Manager gives you that you paste right into the, your sort of like head section of your website more or less. This is like the, the big idea. What this lets you do is it lets you add um, scripts to a website without actually like redeploying that website. And so for tracking code, this is frequently very useful where like say you're a marketer or a product manager or something like that, you want to add some tracking code to uh, certain pages or otherwise fire certain events. You don't have to loop in the like engineering team to redeploy the website every time you want to change a little bit of tracking code. Um, Google Tag Manager also gives you a pretty nice sandbox to make sure that you don't accidentally like break the site if you add some bad JavaScript or something like that. So we've installed, we've, we've installed Google Tag Manager here and just kind of as proof of that, um, I'm going to open up the dev console. And so we're going to spend uh, some amount of time in here today. Um, and the page isn't loading. I don't know if it's a, what's happening. No dice. Claire, do you know? Can we blame Netlify? Netlify was playing up yesterday. <laughs> Yikes. No, we can't blame Netlify. What's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. Do you want me to share my screen? I'll see if it works. Can yeah. you the tag manager part and see what happens? It's like not so good the site. Let me do a hard refresh here. Maybe, that, maybe that'll help. OK, hard refresh, when in doubt. All right, so what we're doing here with this, uh, this search bar is we're filtering all the network requests that are being made. This is a pretty simple website, so there's only like you know, there's some, there's the website itself. Um, there's all of our styles that make the website look very nice. Um, this is the actual uh, Google Tag Manager include that I actually added in the website today. So what this lets us do is pop over to Google Tag Manager to this container that I've already created. And now we can go ahead and start creating some tags that will be embedded into the website. So to do that, I'm gonna press the tags button. I'm gonna make a new tag. I'm going to call this uh, snowplow tracker. And I'm going to pick this custom HTML tag. There's a whole bunch of different options here that if you're curious, I'd be happy to talk about maybe afterwards. Uh, but for snowplow, uh, this works great. And I'm going to furiously type out 15 lines of JavaScript. Just kidding. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste 15 lines or so of JavaScript. So this is the actual like snowplow tracking code. And it's obviously pretty short. Um, what this is doing is something really clever that you might see in different JavaScript libraries. Um, this is sort of dynamically downloading the like real snowplow tracking script. And it does so in a way that's um, asynchronous. So we should see a bunch of minified JavaScript code. This is the real snowplow tracker. And the reason Snowplow is, is doing all of this is because you might be firing events before that JavaScript snippet actually gets downloaded to your browser. And so all this clever code here is intended to collect the events and hold on to them until the script gets downloaded so that the browser will know, now know how to send the events to Snowplow. So this is all like kind of boilerplate. Every time I install Snowplow on a website, I use pretty much this. Um, I'm going to pull up in the chat. Okay. That's for I just want, didn't want to forget it. Okay. Um, this might be out of date. You should use, when you can, the latest uh, Snowplow or any library version uh, you can, DBT included. You should all upgrade to 0.16.1 if you haven't already. Uh, there will be a quiz afterwards. Um, okay. And here's where the kind of actual Snowplow setup stuff happens. So this initializes a new tracker. Um, this is like an, an identifier for the, actually, I'm not exactly sure. This is this stands for CloudFront, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but I'd be curious to know exactly why this gets set here and what other values you can set it to. Um, 
then there's a, but anyway, I think the point is it's like mostly metadata or you can configure individual trackers with this. Is that right? I am not sure. Okay. We do not work on our tracker, but let me see if I can find Fair it. Fair enough. I, I think it, you can have multiple trackers on one page and this helps you identify them and like do different things with them. Um, okay, and then there's a collector URL. So let's talk about what's actually happening here on this website, or at least what we want to happen when we add the tracking code. Every time I load the page, I want a little event to fire from this website to a snowplow collector. And that collector is going to collect the event that says there was a page view. It was from this you know, user's cookie. The user agent was XYZ. Um, the IP address was whatever. And snowplow has a bunch of different uh, faculties for configuring the data that actually gets collected and loaded into your warehouse. So you could, for instance, like pseudonymize IP addresses or other PII. But fundamentally, what we want to happen is we want to like send a little ping with a little packet of information to some collector. So in this case, we've already set up a collector on our end. Uh, Snowplow is open source, so you could run one of these things yourself. Um, and this is the thing that's going to actually receive the event, process it, and then later load it into your warehouse. Um, this app ID is just to identify different types of events. So for us, we have Snowplow installed on uh, a couple different websites. We want to easily be able to see like, was it this website or that website? The app ID helps you very quickly filter for uh, things without using like a domain name, for instance. Um, and the other thing to talk about in the config front is this web page context. Um, there's a lot that we can say about contexts, but suffice to say that you're going to want to include this if you're doing um, web event tracking. This will associate different events that happen in a single page view together. So you can see that, for instance, a user stuck around on the site for 60 seconds versus you know two hours. Uh, It'll let you collect all these different events that happen and say like they all happen on one single page view. Finally, this is the actual call that will emit the page view now that the tracker has been all configured. And um, when this line of JavaScript runs, Snowplow should actually send the event to our collector URL. So Drew, you pasted this, uh, this straight in. I'm interested, where did you copy it from? Or where would like, if I was doing this myself, where could I go to sort of figure out what I would need to paste in myself? Yeah, the, um, the Snowplow docs are uh, very, very good. What I always find myself typing in Snowplow canonical event model. And I drop in here for the full reference on um, all the columns of the table. We'll actually come to that later. There's also a link to the JavaScript tracker in here. And so we should see in, in the part of uh, the Snowplow docs, there's pretty much this snippet is exactly what we're using. And oh, look at that, 2102. Not so bad, Drew. I did a good job there. OK, cool. And um, there's, a, there's a ton of different configuration options. There are custom events you can send. There's web page. You can also show on performance timing to understand how long your page takes to load, things like that. And you can see like every single um, configuration option that's that's in here. And certainly I, I've used some, but not all of these. So if you have questions about any in particular, um, maybe if it's helpful, I'll drop that link in the chat. Cool. And then um, yeah. sending it to the tracker. So that's the thing that we prepared earlier. Is that um, typically like if you were doing this completely from scratch, doing it all yourself, do you think that's where like someone would probably end up spending the mo most of their time? And that's why like the hosting services exist for that part? Yeah. So running an event collection pipeline, like everything we're looking at here, uh, I think is more or less the easy part. And certainly like there's nothing easy about dealing with time zones and browsers and different devices. Uh, maybe that's not easy per se, but there's a lot of real challenges associated with building a sort of durable event pipeline where for instance, like you never want to lose an event. You always want to make sure that if you can't process, process an event, you store it somewhere safe for later. Or if, um, there's network failures. You know, you're, there, we can talk maybe more about the, the pipeline itself, what that actually entails. But things fail sometimes. So being able to retry these processes and like uh, uh, durably store and replay events, these are all really difficult problems. And as a result, uh, there's a whole lot of logic in the Snowplow uh, collector and enricher and loader parts of the pipeline um, that make sure that you like don't lose data and everything gets in your database like quickly and accurately. So yes, that is a harder thing to set up just because there's more moving pieces, I think. Although I haven't installed one of these um, collectors in, in quite a long time, I'm sure they've come a long way. Um, 
I think we use the streaming, the Scala streaming uh, pipeline, and I think it works very well for us with like minimal maintenance required. But yeah, it can be, you, you gotta go pretty deep in AWS land to set one of these things up uh, if you're running it on your own infrastructure. And certainly uh, if someone wants to host it for you, that could be well worth the, um, uh, well worth the investment. Okay, so I figure next steps, we're gonna actually turn this thing on and start tracking some events. Does anyone have any other like, Claire, Jeremy, anything I didn't hit that you wanna talk about? Good. I'm just Small question. So, like, um, do you have to pre-create much before you sort of uh, send new trackers in there? Like, so, do you know there's already a new tracker in Snowflake configured to to pull that in? Like, uh, like, will that bounce if you don't have one set up? Yeah. So you're gonna need uh, a collector running on some server uh, yeah. at, at some URL, and if that thing's not running, I think the way Snowplow works these days is if the request can't be made, the event gets kind of stashed into local storage. And then it'll be retried on every page load. Uh, but eventually, you know, like, uh, with with like Kafka, like you, you can set Kafka to either accept any new topic that might go to the endpoint, or sometimes Kafka you have to set everything up like before it can come through. Right. So is that a configuration thing on Snowplow, or is it just anything that goes to that endpoint? It'll just consume, and you just filter later in your warehouse. Yeah, I think it's exactly that. If you pipe the events in, Snowplow will make sure they show up in your database. Cool. I'm not aware of any such config where you'd have to specify something on the collector end to only allow certain events. Right. Um, um, maybe the thing worth saying about that is if you do have new custom events or custom properties of those events, you do need to set up JSON schemas for validation. But are you getting there, Drew? I'm so sorry. I wasn't going to get there, but we can get there if you want. Yeah. So um, like, if you're doing pretty crazy work, maybe you need to do some work on the collector or hosting side first, but yeah. not for anything baked in. Spot on. Okay, we can come back to custom events because they are kind of like, uh, obviously when you're searching more custom stuff, it's not going to be like uh, one line of JavaScript here. And we can talk about how Snowplow handles custom events compared to maybe some other tools out there and, and approaches. Um, okay, so we'll come back to that part. So now I want to set up a, right, let me, let me go back for a second. What we're doing right here is we're creating a new tag. So this is the Snowplow tracker tag. It's a script tag that will get kind of pushed into the website. So here we want to trigger this tag, and we want to say, like, uh, run this in certain scenarios. And in this case, the default trigger in GTM is run this on all page views. You can make other um, triggers if we just want to see. If I keep pressing the plus button, we'll get there. Okay, so page view, DOM ready, window loaded. Um, one of the ones that's really helpful is history change. If you have a single page app, maybe you're not doing a full page reload. It's, it's like React. Uh, you can trigger on a history change and send, like, a virtual page view. Um, that I use that one a lot. Uh, so you can make custom triggers and events and things like that too, uh, more advanced usage. But for us, we're just we're going to say run this tag on all page views. So I'll go ahead and save this. And one of the really cool things you can do in Google Tag Manager is preview this code. So I haven't actually released it yet, but in my browser, um, I actually had an issue with this earlier today, but let's see if it works. When I reload this page, we should see create this Google Tag Manager debugger. So we can see that the Snowplow tracker tag fired on this page. We can see the HTML contents. Everything looks really good. Assuming our tracking code is correct, we should see that an event was fired. And one of the ways we can check that out is by searching for, I think this happens to be the URL scheme. We'll look at a better version of this in a second. But I, at the point I want to make is just that this is a post request to some URL that contains an event payload. So ultimately, it's just a regular browser post. Like uh, if, if anyone here has done any web development, it's, it's not so unusual. This is the mechanism whereby you get data into Snowplow anymore. A very handy thing that you can do is pull up this uh, Snowplow event debugger plugin from the folks at uh, Poplin Data. And uh, I, use, I use the heck out of this. I'm a really big fan of this tool. So every time you load the page, uh, you'll see the event that fires, and you can click in here and kind of investigate the nature of the event. Uh, it's much nicer to look at this kind of screen than it is to look at uh, this kind of screen. Uh, if you're doing any debugging on, like, why aren't my events firing, or is this event firing correctly? So we can see this is a page view event. We see the application ID that we configured in Google Tag Manager. Every event gets a unique ID, and then we can... Um, 
when I give this talk internally at Fishtown Analytics uh, about event tracking, it's called A Brief History of Timestamps. And we spent a lot of time talking about the different timestamps involved for, for an event. So this is when the event was sourced. This is when it was actually sent to the collector. Later on, we'll see that there's a collector timestamp and, and other associated timestamps too. And you can use this to kind of put, create a puzzle that you have to solve of like how things are happening in the world. Uh, we can talk a lot more about timestamps on uh, client browsers if anyone uh, wants to be upset later. I know I do. So you can see this is a web event, great. And now this is sort of the custom context thing we were just talking about a little bit before. If I had other events on this page, I'd see the same page view ID replicated on every single event. This would let us kind of join all those events together and say like, here are all the things that happened in, in one page view. So you, uh, you view the page, you clicked around for 30 seconds, you clicked a link and, and exited, for instance. You could answer that question, like those kinds of questions with this ID. We talk a lot more about this, but here's a user cookie. Um, you can see I had two distinct sessions. We can also talk a lot about, about sessionization if anyone's interested. Um, these are all like unique identifiers. Um, I think the way we have this set up right now, there's uh, actually zero PII flowing um, in, in these events, which is nice. And then, okay, user agent, kind of standard event tracking stuff. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to submit this thing because this just passed QA. Thank you all for your help and quality assurance here. I'm going to submit this and I'm going to call it um, initial release, add snowplow tracking for page views. And I'm going to go ahead and publish it. And now the thing I need everyone to do, uh, Claire, would you be so kind as to, I guess I have it handy. Everyone who's interested, who wants to be a part of this demo, I just pasted a link into um, the chat. And if you could navigate to that URL, what we should see is that with our real-time Snowplow pipeline, we should see your page views flow through into our Snowflake account uh, within the next like minute or so. Um, I'll show you a very quick example of what that's going to look like. And then I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy to actually talk a lot more about the analysis piece. Drew, are you going to turn on page pings, or is that another? bonus thing that uh, we don't want to cover right now. Sure, Jeremy, I'll turn on page things. <laughs> uh, activity tracking, enable activity yeah. or tracking, yeah. This guy? That guy. Cool. All right, well, we're, we're doing version two. This wasn't in the original spec for anyone. Uh, I'm so sorry. I know on, as yeah. a product manager, I has, should have. Has VTM always had versions yeah it's pretty good oh i remember like being told avoid gtm just because you it has no versions but well maybe, oh i guess they're actually maybe they're a little bit more recent they're not it's not like git version control yeah. but it's decent for this kind of thing oh. so i'll just say four words about this um maybe a couple more than that um maybe this will no plow dot yeah. enable tracking <laughs> um five words um what this is going to do is it's going to fire what's called a page ping. Um, the way we've configured it is the first page ping will fire 10 seconds after page load, and every subsequent page ping will happen 10 seconds after that. Um, you can find more information in the documentation that's been linked to. Uh, what this lets you do is understand how long a user is actually on a page for. And so, for instance, say it's, it's blog content. You want to know um, kind of two things. One is how long was the person looking and interacting with the page for? And two is maybe like how far down the page did they scroll? And so these page pings when they fire will tell you like, first of all, every time it fires on a given page view, you know the user's been there for 10 more seconds. You can add these up and get a sense for how long they're sticking around for. Um, you can also see like their vertical scroll depth, for instance. So they read 5% of the blog post that you spent nine months writing. Um, maybe, maybe you'll go get some writing uh, classes or something like that. It's a good, it's a good takeaway. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. And um, just before I publish it, I want to make sure I did that right. So we'll refresh. We'll pop this open. And this is a cool um, use for the debugger. And so one of the cool things about Snowplow is it's only when you're interacting with the site that you'll get one of these page pings to fire. So if someone just has like the page open in the background, it, it won't fire pings. But here's a page ping. You can see like my offset. So I was 288 pixels offset from the top of the page. And somewhere way down here, we can find our browser dimensions. Um, 
uh, not resolution, who sees it, viewport size. And so you can do some math to figure out like, okay, you're 268 pixels down the page or, or whatever it was, um, 288 pixels. That map's still like you consuming 10% of the info on the page. And so for a lot of uh, either product or like content analytics, you'd want to know like, are people even seeing the calls to action on the website or did they, did they not get that call for instance? So, okay, that looks good to me. I'm going to publish it. B2 adds pings. Thanks for indulging me, Drew. Jeremy, it was my distinct pleasure. Okay, so now the bad news is everyone has to go back to this website and click around some more so we get that sweet, sweet oh, no, data. No. And um, uh, if you just scroll up and down a little bit, you'll get, you'll get some good page ping data for them. Drew, I don't know if it's fair to say, but I feel like uh, page views, page pings are the two um, things on top of just the absolute bare minimum implementation that we do across the board whenever we implement Snowplow. And then most of the stuff beyond that is a little more dependent on what the site is, how we expect people to be interacting with it. Absolutely. Um, everyone we work with has specific things that they care about. Um, we, I guess this is an interesting thing to say. Uh, it might be, uh, it might sound compelling to track everything that happens anywhere on the site. And Snowplow's auto tracking will do a good job of, of capturing link clicks and form submissions and things like that. But if there are specific events that you really care about, it's important to have like a good uh, workflow in place for making sure that like, say the website doesn't change out from under you in a way that breaks tracking or that event definitions are really consistent. And Snowplow has a, a good schema approach that helps you with this. Um, so every time we do event tracking, and admittedly we do a little bit less of this these days than, than we once did, um, we always worked with the product owners or site owners to make sure that we were tracking the stuff that was important to them and verifying that like uh, we, we had all the data they cared about. Um, can I just, <laughs> I just went to this on my phone as well. <laughs> I think I made this site mobile responsive and I'm really proud of myself from a year and a half ago that my random landing yeah. page for that's, like side projects. That's great. Responsive. Let's get some other user agents in there. Yeah. Let's get so some you, mobile browser visits. He's got an yeah. iPad, yeah. Um, so this actually will work for mobile browser too, but if Claire were to launch her own iOS app, which is just um, the same, you know, basic information, <laughs> it would not automatically fire. We would have to use a different snowplow tracker. Cool. Um, Drew, are you good for me to take this over? Um, Jeremy, I sure am. I'm just running the query now to make sure that all the events are firing. Otherwise... This would make for a pretty bad demo. Okay, cool. Why don't you run that query and see if there are good results before I run that query while screen sharing. Does anyone have any like uh, questions or thoughts so far on the tracking piece of this? Um, well, I had a question that I put in earlier, which is um, we installed it through GTM. You can also install snippets like directly onto your website. Um, why did we choose GTM? Are we going to regret that later? Uh, yeah. Sure. So I think we had a really good example where uh, the initial version, which I will repeat, was coded to spec, uh, was, was not correct. <laughs> Just kidding, Jeremy. Um, so we, we were able to, with a couple of clicks in 30 seconds, uh, redeploy the tracking code um, pretty quickly. If we didn't do that, if we put the snowplow tracking logic directly in the website, I would have instead showed you me opening my terminal, running Hugo to build clairecarol.com and messing around in some like deep in the templated, you know, uh, head part of the web page to, to add the tracking code. It would then be a lot more difficult to test because I'd have to like come back to my local web server that's, that's building the site, uh, test the events are firing and, and kind of switch back between like my terminal and um, my text editor, which happens for me to be in my terminal, but, um, and the web browser. So I use Vim, I don't know if anyone knew that. Um, so yes, GTM really shines when you have kind of discrete changes like this and where the nature of the changes are well suited for someone that isn't particularly involved with the development of the site itself. Uh, if you had much richer event tracking, like say in a very responsive uh, single page React application with a, a complex cart and different variants for products, things like that, you, you probably wouldn't want to do a ton of this tracking in GTM 
because it lives very far away from your code and it's easy to, to change the code in a way that breaks the web tracking code, um, the, web, the web tracking scripts. So in this case, it's a benefit, but uh, in some cases, you, you would want to put the tracking code a lot closer to the, the application code. Right on. And Jericho, uh, query returned successfully. It looks like you've got some data to model. Cool. So I'm going to do that uh, right now, in fact. Uh, so we've got this, this table raw.snowplow.event, which I think is the result of um, a snow pipe pulling these files from S3. So the entire end-to-end -end pipeline through, as Drew said, the streaming collector plops the results in S3 and then uh, snow pipes in the snowflake. It's about a minute, a couple of minutes. So we've got a nice good variety of events. We've got some page views. We've got some page pings in here too, um, mostly from web. Hopefully we'll get some mobile, some iPads in there too. Um, and uh, I think a couple different domain user IDs. This is our anonymous cookie ID. So as long as you're visiting from a different browser, um, we're gonna see someone different show up here. So this is pretty interesting, but this is the canonical event model. We've got something like 120 columns in here. Um, I need to transform this data in some way to make it more meaningful or at least easier to talk about. Um, because someone having a thousand page pings on Claire's website or um, a thousand times clicking the button if we had such a thing enabled to visit her Twitter page, um, that's only so interesting to me, but knowing that a thousand different people click that Twitter button, maybe that's a little more interesting. Maybe Claire's about to blow up online. So does anybody have any, any thoughts? Drew mentioned a word earlier. Oh, didn't want to do that. Um, of what we do here. What we want to do. This is a DBT office hour, so it's probably going to involve DBT. Um, the answer is that there's a pretty cool package of SQL transformations um, which work pretty well with Snowplow data, um, where we can just start with some base events um, plus web page context. Okay, that's something to think about. And then roll all the way up to sessions, page views and sessions, as well as I see here some user stitching, a Snowplow ID map. So if anybody were to have somehow logged in on Claire's website, um, we could even say that that login uh, was actually responsible for some anonymous page views in the past as well. So I think um, this is gonna be fun if we can go all the way zero to hero in a 30 minute meal. Well, let's um, snowplow office hours demo, why not? So let's get ourselves, not that, um, a nice brand new dbt project. Go ahead and kill the example models, although they're really helpful. So of course, uh, most people would just already have their dbt project set up and- Of course. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Um, but here we are, we're doing it live. Um, one, that's, that's pretty bold. And I'm going to use my um, Fishtown Snowflake account profile here because uh, the data lives in our Fishtown Snowflake um, account. Yep. So uh, let's make an initial first model here and um, call it something like stage. Is this it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the consonants of my, uh, of my name. Event. And maybe this is our model. Except, of course, I want this to be something more like that. Oops, snowplow event. And maybe add a little source snowplow here. Uh, for anyone who wants bonus points, this is, of course, where um, if we wanted to be staging this data as an external table, we could do that here, too. That's, that's just a little extra. We've already got it as a real snowflake table, so we can just create this as any standard source name event. Okay, cool. Should that work? I sure hope it does. So 
So all we should be doing right now is just creating that initial view model, which is going to show us events, only the ones that have taken place on clairecarol.com. Cool. Now, whenever I want to install a package, I'm just going to do it by going to the hub site, the home for all things dbt package related. I know I'm going fast here, so please stop me as soon as you have questions. And because I've obviously read through the documentation of this package, um, it's going to tell me that there are some prerequisites. Yeah, we needed to install the JavaScript tracker. That's pretty good. Installation instructions and configuration. There's a lot of variables here, some of which are required, others of which are not. Um, we can stick this right in dbtprojects.yaml. I think that just needs to go in one. Um, so you see we've got a whole lot, bunch of configuration options which do not relate to the tracker per se, but do relate to um, telling this package of dbt models and transformations a little bit about how we've set up our data. So how do we want the events to show up or the sessions to show up at the end? Do we want to see um, the, everything converted from say like UTC to East Coast time zone? I, I think so. How often did we set up our page pings to ping? Indeed, we set them up for 10 seconds. What are our base events? Well, I just created a model called stage Clark Carroll event. What's the web page context? Okay, that's gonna be a little bit trickier and we'll talk about that in a second. But for now, uh, we're not using an extra user agent context. We're not using an extra performance timing context. Um, we don't have any extra columns that I wanna show up in the session at the end, at least not yet. And then this, again, a little more complicated and related to um, the way that these models are going to be built incrementally. So I think for now, we're in okay shape. I really just copied and pasted this from the package readme. Um, let's just try to give that. Might need a little uh, DBT depths. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Very good. So very quickly uh, in a couple of sentences, what is a package, mm -hmm. Jeremy? A package is um, someone else's SQL. <laughs> that's, that's my couple of words. Uh, it's uh, a collection of macros and or models that I want to build on top of and import into my own root dbt project. So um, I think folks are generally aware of dbt utils for helpful things like a union relations macro or a pivot macro. Um, dbt utils is just macros, macros only. But here we've also got, I think I need to just do that. Let's try that. Um, We've also got some models, and we'll see that in a second. And so because Snowplow data, it's sort of the same structure, whether we're using it for my personal website, whether we're using it for a client website, we can right on. apply the same transformations to it. That's exactly right. Um, you know, this one table, this raw dot Snowplow event table, actually contains all of the Snowplow information that is being fired from this website. This is... I don't want to um, speak too specifically, but this is one of the things that we really prefer about Snowplow compared with um, other clickstream event tracking platforms is there are no other tables for like custom events or super properties versus medium properties versus minor properties. Like it's pages versus tracks, one could even say, versus identify. Everything is just an event. An event is everything and everything is an event. If there is information that exists beyond this canonical model of all the columns I've got here, it exists in a JSON payload, which is called contexts and is here right at the very end. You can see this is actually where our page view ID is going to come from. See that, that web page tracking that we enabled earlier. We've got contexts, web page, page view ID. What's that? Even on Redshift? Does it get? Uh, in the JSON payload. So because Redshift and JSON uh, don't go so well together, if you are loading Snowplow through some kind of um, extract and load software like Stitch or Fivetran, 
even if you're loading it from S3, um, usually the way they go about it is splitting context into a separate one-to-many table with the expectation that then you join them together later. And as we'll see, the Snowplow package actually was originally written to expect that arrangement such that events are in one table and context, each context is in a different table. Um, Snowflake, which is wonderful and gives us a lot of JSON functionality, that's not something we need. We can just unnest them directly from events. So I've built my dbt docs and you'll see that we've actually got, in addition to our demo model, we've now got a whole bunch of additional models and a CSV and macros. And all those macros are now documented as of 090. Isn't that cool? Um, so if I go to just expand, ooh, that's not, not as cool. What we've got here, this is everything that I'm circling here on the left, this is all that I made myself. The rest came as a result of having installed this package. So with a few minor tweaks that we're about to do, I can go all the way from a raw table and a very thin layer of logic that I wanted to put on top of it, just to say, give me Claire's events only, all the way up to a final sessions table. Is that an adventure that we're uh, ready to go on? Great. So I'm just gonna cancel that docs. Um, as I was mentioning, or as Claire, thank you for asking, we don't have a separate table for the web page context as we would if this were, for instance, Fivetran loading this data into Redshift. What we have to do instead is actually create our own web page context. Um, this is a cool thing that we have to do sometimes, which is overriding a model in a package. I just happen to know that the version we're going to use here is page views default and snowplow web page context. The best way to override one of these models when we need to change the logic a little bit is to copy and paste it and give it the same name, as well as then coming in here and saying, uh, that's all well and good. Default snowplow, nope, uh, yes, web page context enabled false. And that matches exactly the file path of this model in the package that I'm installing. So all I've done is disable the package version of this model and say, I'd like to use my own instead. Um, what are the changes we're going to make here? Well, importantly, because we don't have a table of the web page context all by itself already split out for us by an ENL tool, we are just going to pull these off of events instead. So events flattened. I hope we're excited for this to me to be doing this live. I did, I did it before. Don't worry. Uh, lateral flatten input. Um, I don't think I need to, well, never hurts. So I only really care right now about the web page context. We could send a bunch of others. We could send like optimizely experiment context or performance timing context or um, even GA context to like link Snowplow together with uh, GA if you still have product managers who are using GA dashboards for directional um, information, but you actually want the raw events too, which Snowplow gives you. So I know I want the event ID. Oops. And I know I want the page view ID, which is going to be value um, data dot ID as page view ID. The way I know that is just based on how it is nested in here. So I'm filtering on the schema like this. Give me the, this ID and call it page view ID. Really, this is just having done it before, but it's not um, rocket science. Does that work? I think it should. We'll maybe come back and do one other thing uh, later on. Oh, I don't need that. And I do need to rename it, name it like this. This just anticipates the naming that um, um, Fitcher yeah. 5 trend would do in Redshift. Uh, line 40 from... Thank you, Flattened. Yes. Um, do I need any other group buys? I need anything. 
think that will work. Hey, Jericho. Yeah. Never mind. Sorry. You you're already filtering this for just the Claire Carroll events in the. That's right. In this model. staging model. Understood. Got mm -hmm. it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Really good point. And you know, because I'm building one model on top of the other, um, I don't need to do it all every single time. So I think I can just give this a run and let's hope. I've got nine models now, even though I really only have two defined in the project. Um, and it will figure out to prefer my version of web page context over the packages version because I've disabled that one. Oh no. Let's see what, what happens. Any questions while I wait for these logs to come back? Oh, that's just my absolute favorite, isn't it? Oh, I know. Ha. Uh, because I didn't cast this to Vercare, page view ID was actually still a variant value. It was still like a JSON value. Um, so I think I'm hopeful that that's what it is. One potentially interesting thing is in addition to being able to view them in the documentation where they will show up, I can always click into this like dbt modules folder, which is always added to and overwritten by dbt depths, just to see all of this, all of the snowplow assets that I've now installed in my project. Um, so for instance, here are all the models, page views, default because I'm not running a BigQuery, snowplow page views, Here's all the SQL that's going to be run. I mean, all the gentrified DBT SQL. And you can see it's, it's doing things like um, what number page view is this in the session? Uh, what's the page view index? What's, what, when did the page view start? When did it end using those page pings? Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. That's pretty exciting. If I come in here, and maybe select from dbt j cohen um, snowplow sessions uh, whoops i've gone all the way from having just events to having sessions here where they've been rolled up and I've got a lot, of, a lot of good stuff here. So like what number session is this? I think for the user, how long were they engaged? It's always a little bit approximate you know, based on um, the number of page pings that were fired. So here we've got five page pings were fired, 50 seconds, I guess. Um, did they bounce, which is I think defined in a, in a pretty standard way um, in our sessionization package. It's like if they stayed on for a number of uh, seconds or visited enough pages, and all of our timestamps, as, as Drew mentioned earlier, all of our user agent information, which has been actually during the enrichment process was split out into operating system information, browser information. Um, all of these marketing columns, whoops, would be if Claire had, um, had UTMs on ads perhaps that, you know, if she wanted to advertise her 
website as a paid search on Google if you wanted to buy your own keywords and then throw some UTMs on here to see if uh, it's worth your money. Uh, IP information, which I think uh, we scrubbed a little bit. That's good. No PII. Um, uh, approximate zip code and approximate where these people are. A lot of Philly, Pennsylvania. That's good. Maybe that's me. And then kind of most importantly, if we were, and I mentioned this earlier, if we were firing events that set some kind of business specific ID, you know, Claire wanted to assign people <laughs> friend IDs and had a database table of all of her friends, I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> and then wanted to set, no, I'm just kidding. Wanted to set them all as people visit her website to be like, oh, that anonymous visitor, that was actually my friend. Maria. Really? He probably has what record and it's Jeremy Cohen. <laughs> uh, that's a, well, you know, uh, mismatch, merge conflict. Um, the, we would actually be able to pull those user custom IDs through here and override whatever the domain ID, whatever the um, cookie anonymous ID is here in this inferred user ID. So we don't have any of them right now just because uh, we didn't set any, and I think these are actually empty strings instead of nulls. Otherwise, we would have the user domain um, flowing through here as well. So this does a lot of what we expect web events to be able to do for us, but already in a pretty aggregated form, uh, which you know, is beneficial for a couple reasons. We've got 28 total sessions in there, but that's actually the aggregate result of, well, okay, 82 events total. But still, you can imagine uh, billions of events actually aggregate down to millions of sessions with maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands of users. And all built incrementally so that uh, when you rerun, we don't have to reprocess all that data again. That's a really good point. And I was actually going to Sorry. very quickly, no, no, no. Uh, you know, one of the downsides of having Stitcher 5 Trend load into Redshift is when they split out the context, for some reason, they don't include that, that key timestamp, the collector timestamp, which you can view as like the ETL timestamp when it was arriving at the collector, which is a proxy for when it arrived in S3 and then when it arrived in your database. We can, so you see there's a comment here, like this one's a little tougher to make incremental. JK, we totally can. And then everything will be built incrementally. Uh, how much do we trust me doing this right now? Uh, uh, let's Can you explain let's... to me, like, what does one record in the context table represent? Yeah, it's, it's going to be, um, I mean, in this case, because we're filtering it to just pull web page context, there uh -huh. should only be one page view ID per event. So it actually should be at the same, uh, it should be one to one, but you can have potentially many custom contexts for a given snowplow event, because it could be one context about the page view ID, one context about optimize the experiments, one context about um, page load timing. Each one of those is like an extra piece of contextual information. Mm -hmm. And so one event can have many contexts. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're missing if is... on... Go ahead. You're missing if on that is incremental. Um, am if I is incremental. If, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and I need to do a couple more things here. I need to actually keep the timestamp around. Hey, Jeremy. Yes. We're a little bit close on time, and while I have um, unfettered trust in your ability to write all the SQL perfectly the first time around, maybe it'd be cool if we uh, use the last couple of minutes here to answer any questions folks might have. That's a good point. True. Right as I was finishing. Um, you can it. I'm not going to stop writing it. No, no, no. That's good. Uh, yeah, let's definitely hit up some questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, is anyone here currently a Snowplow user? Okay, 
couple of you. Uh, are you doing anything like maybe really noteworthy in, in your setups that, uh, that we didn't touch on here that you'd like to share? I have a question. Well, I actually have lots of questions, but I'll just choose one. Um, what have you guys done in terms of like limiting the amount of data that's available to the end user um, when you've implemented this with clients in the past? So for me right now, we have very, something very similar to a Snowplow setup. Um, and we have the sessionized data set, which is not built incrementally yet, which it really should be. But we also have um, like an explorer view that's meant for just funnels, funnel building. Um, and that one's built incrementally and it's limited to the, just the last 60 days, which I don't love. I would love to go, go back further, especially since it's the only place that PMs can really explore data. Um, but yeah, just curious if you have any advice around like how to make it faster and I don't know, better. Okay. I guess it's me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think with, with all things like this, anytime you're talking performance, uh, the, number one thing you can do is just like reduce the amount of data that you query. So this is why we aggregate events into page views and then sessions in the Snowplow package. Um, querying a session is gonna be an order of magnitude less data than querying the raw, raw events. Um, I think that a sort of like semantic roll up like that, where you condense events into sessions is gonna be more helpful in general than kind of condensing things by like day or hour. For instance, I've seen folks do that where they have a table with like, one record per hour with event aggregates and like it's kind of hard to answer you can show a time yeah. series pretty well but it's hard to answer other questions with that so yeah um it is one of those hard things like clickstream data is always usually the biggest data set we we encounter in a given database uh mm -hmm. and i mean the unfortunate question i have to ask you is like which database are you using some of them have better faculties for, for dealing with very large data sets that are significantly yeah. larger than, than the rest of them. Um, we're using Redshift right now, but we're exploring migrating to Snowflake. Sure. You know, the, the way Redshift uh, causes problems here is just that like you have to size it to be able to handle your, your biggest query on your biggest table. Um, and it means that anytime you're not querying events, um, if you do size it up to be big enough to run really quickly on event streams, uh, you're like wasting a lot of capacity. Um, so, Right, there are other databases that, that don't make you trade off quite like that, but mm -hmm. fundamentally it's just like it's general performance, like check your sort and disk keys and uh, aggregate stuff uh, when, when you can lose the dimensionality, I guess. Yeah. Have you seen pushback from clients um, where the PMs or the marketers in the organization don't only want to read from this data, like don't only want to explore data from this data set, they also really like either like in heat there's like the queer explorer or in google analytics obviously lots of marketers are super comfortable with it um do you experience pushback in that way or have you um it? no i mean the other i think it's good that we we focused on snowplow here but there are certainly other tools that do event tracking like say heap and segment they all they all have their own like relative pros and cons and are, are to some extent are for different audiences or, or maybe different use cases in particular um or at least where they shine um, and so I would say like, if you're, if you do have an audience that's happiest in, in Google analytics and you try to like force them to query, to say a snowplow events table, like they're not going to be particularly happy, particularly happy with that, uh, interface into the data. So, yeah. um, one of the things we try to do is like with our snowplow sessionization, we try to always have foreign keys that join back to more granular tables. Uh, so for instance, on the sessions table, you can still join back to get all the page views that happened in that session. In same way, page views, you can drain back to the events that participate in that page view. And so you can do some work to kind of filter the set of sessions you care about <clears throat> and then apply those filters back to raw data if you really do want to dig all the way in. Cool, thanks. Sure thing. Um, I'm curious when we've done this for clients who have relied on GA data and um, we then sort of go and recreate that like iconic GA dashboard of like, uh, you know, uh, traffic uh, sessions and uh, new versus return users. Um, how closely, like, does Snowplow tend to match that dashboard? Um, this was the most fun part of instrumenting Snowplow for me was making the numbers match up with with uh, GA. With no and, like insight whatsoever into what GA is doing as well. Yeah, 
it's totally black box. It's like they say, these are the numbers by day for the last month. And I look at the Snowplow numbers and we're off by like an order of magnitude. And the question is like, did I mess up or did Google mess up? And uh, so the reality is most of the time, there are subtle differences in, in how specifically sessions are tracked. So a session is like a human construct. Uh, it's not um, it's not one of the axioms of the universe like web sessions. So Snowplow, at least um, uh, default stock configuration, a session will expire after like 30 minutes of um, no activity occurring. So if you have a page view and 15 minutes later you reload the page, that's one session. If you then wait 35 minutes and reload the page, this is now your second session. Um, Google Analytics does something, a couple things really strange. It will generate a new session for you at midnight exactly. So if you're using a website at 11.59 p.m. and then it goes, the clock ticks to midnight, your next page view, even if it's a minute later, is now in a new session. Um, I think they do this for performance reasons. You can kind of see it in the GA360 data in BigQuery, if you ever check that out. It's all date partition. Um, that's one quirk that usually um, corresponds to a lot of the differences we see in Snowplow and GA metrics. The other one is that like, if you come in via a different channel, you get a new session. So if you click an email link and go to a website and then you click a like pay-per-click ad and come back to the website, those will look like two different sessions. They'll be attributed separately. Uh, even if they happen like within minutes of each other. Um, those are usually the culprits. What we find though is that folks, when they set up event tracking, um, sometimes like do it wrong and they have double counted their page views on specific URLs for like months and months and had no idea. Um, so it is nothing else a good opportunity to like investigate the page views and try to like actually audit the events that are firing, which is kind of a general thing. Anytime you do any event tracking, like you do want to make sure you audit this stuff and make sure that it's working correctly in prod. Uh, it's the kind of thing where silent failures can, can really mess up uh, some of your instincts about how things are going. Uh, so the more you can do to check those things uh, and assert that your ideas match reality, the better. Another gotcha we ran into with um, tracking, cl using client side tracking versus like some some sort of server side tracking, even like like using segments server side code plus its client side code in certain cases, is the and the web side web if they're navigating using their back button. On the client side, those the JavaScript reruns, even though it's not ref refetching from the server, the JavaScript reruns on that page view and you get uh, additional count, counted events that way. Um, yeah, Sean, that's a great point. Server side tracking is always going to be uh, immensely more accurate and reflective of reality than what you get from a, a client browser. Um, all these events that are firing on someone's browser, like it's happening on, on their machine or device. Uh, and people frequently do set their time zones to like somewhere insensible that doesn't actually match their location, or they configure their year to be 1900 um, because they don't want us to like enjoy our the work that we do <laughs> or I don't know, something like they make it really hard. And it's the nature of event tracking. Um, so yeah, anytime you look at like client reported data, you should have in the back of your head like I don't fully trust this because you know the user can send whatever data they want, and you don't really know what browser. The client server is like, client is when I sent it from my phone, where a server is, it's an API, like the back end that powers my app, which I don't have an app, is actually sending that instead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Cool. Um, hey, Jeremy, are there, what if people are using not Snowplow? Uh, do we have any packages to help them out? Oh, we sure do. Uh, we've also got a segment package, a heap package. Um, I think those are the two. That's it, yeah. No, no mix panel or uh, what kiss metrics type packages. Uh, other options that are out there, and and those tools are are also great, as Drew was saying, and they have different, I think, different target audiences, um, different different um, benefits that you get from them. But I think we quite like. The, the canonical event model that Snowplow offers. And it is a way to assert some level of control over the wildness that is web clickstream data. Okay. I mean, I have so many more questions, but I'll just 
Uh, Drew, what's the craziest thing, what's the craziest event that you've implemented in Snowplow? Um, I think I can say this. Uh, I did event tracking for a uh, movie theater once for their point of sale system. Uh, it helped them uh, track revenue intra month um, because they couldn't get it from the API they were using to like power their actual sales online. Uh, and as as payment, and so I could get a feel for not as payment, but so I could get a feel for what was going on. Uh, they invited me to the movie theater, and I saw two thousand one Space Odyssey there in like seventy millimeter. It was a pretty good deal, all things considered. Amazing. Yeah. Um, DBT also uses Snowplow. It's true. That's uh, yeah. How we know uh, when we we said today that over five thousand companies are using DBT in some um, press releases that maybe you saw today. Uh, and that's how we know that we uh, have anonymous tracking uh, on DBT, which you can opt out of as well. Um, but every time someone does DBT wrong, we get anonymous details um, that, you know, about a hash project ID. Um, so we can actually count the number of projects, weekly active projects. Um, and that's our, our best proxy for like how many, sorry, I said over 5,000, <laughs> that's probably the wrong number. Um, 1,700 companies, 5,000 people in Slack. That one's easier to count. You just go to Slack and look at the number, uh, 17, is it 1700? Is that right? Uh, just about 1700. Yeah. Uh, companies using DBT. So if you were ever interested in how we arrived at that number, uh, you can actually jump into our open source code and then find us, uh, find where we make those calls, those snowplow events. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's all that I wanted to get through. Uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, for implementing tracking on my website. I can now know how popular my static website that I made on December 25, 2018 is. Uh, <laughs> the repo is public, so you can find the commits there. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Drew and Jeremy for joining us. Thank you, Joel, again, for um, the topic suggestion. Um, thank you, Nyanka, for, for joining. Uh, we have uh, fortunately, didn't have too many curly questions that we couldn't answer, so, um, but we're very glad to have you here as well. Um, oh, I've just upgraded Zoom and now I get the things when people like thumbs up. That's a new thing for me. I was on old version of Zoom. Oh my gosh, everyone, please stop. Um, I will actually upload this one. I keep saying that. I never upload any videos, um, but I will do this, this one because I found it's really useful. I have never worked with Snowplow Data. I've worked with Snowplow Data a little, but for our own, um, our own website. Uh, but I've never seen it implemented end to end. So yeah, thank you uh, for joining us and that I could learn and hopefully some of you learned as well. Um, other than that, uh, we'll see you next week. Um, is it Vinzi next week? No, it's uh, Emily from Drizzly is talking about how they share some of the, the results of their DBT models with external stakeholders in a really secure way. Um, so Dr Drizzly are an alcohol delivery company. They have um, data which like their suppliers don't have access to uh in a, you know before drizzly were a partner for them um so how they actually share some of that data back uh with their external stakeholders so i'm really looking forward to that one as well um hopefully some of you can join us for that um but yeah other than that uh i'll hang out here for a few more minutes um uh, but enjoy your wednesday or thursday depending uh which part of the world you're in See ya.